Hi, uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Paul Shari, Senior Fellow here at the Center for New American Security, joined by my colleague Greg Allen, and um, we're here to talk about artificial intelligence and national security. So um, I thought we'd start with a quick overview of kind of what we're doing here in, the, in our program at the Center for New American Security. We're a, um, a bipartisan think tank here in Washington, D.C. We're a non-for-profit independent institution who primarily national security work. And our goal is pragmatic and principled national security policies. Um, so they don't have to be necessarily centrist. We're not always looking for the, you know, the lowest common denominator, a watered down position. We have people that are Republicans and Democrats on our team. Um, and we, we like healthy disagreement about a range of different uh, ways to you know, protect the United States, protect um, our national security interests. And we cover a range of topics. We look at Middle East, Asia Pacific, um, defense issues, uh, military and veterans issues. Oh, Greg and I work in the technology and national security program. And so our program looks at um, different evolving technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence, surveillance, cybersecurity, um, or, or other kinds of range of technologies, and how they might affect national security, what the United States needs to be investing in, and then how we should anticipate what others might do. We just launched a major initiative on artificial intelligence, and what will be a major focus of our research for the next year. Uh, Greg recently authored a report on artificial intelligence and national security, and so that's something that um, we'll talk about today, both uh, Greg's report and then some particular issues going, going forward. Great, and uh, I'll just add to that that I came on specifically because I was very interested and excited uh, in the artificial intelligence and global security initiative we are doing here at CNAS. Um, I think what I would add to Paul's statement is that we often get asked to advise uh, stakeholders in the U.S. government, uh, in international institutions, um, and so we are producing this research uh, in the hopes that it will actually get used to inform and influence policy, and then we also have a public education mission, whether that be uh, writing stuff that goes into public-facing publications, uh, releasing our reports, or just engaging with the general public. So uh, our job is to try and come up with good ideas and then get them out there to lead to positive decisions. Uh, when it comes to the national security community. And we think we do a pretty good job of that. Uh, and we that's exactly why we're excited to be here with you today. So let's go ahead and get started. We've got a list of um, some great questions already up on Reddit. Um, what, what do you want to start, Greg? What, what do you want to dive in? Uh, I think I'd love to start with uh, the question, how did your study on artificial intelligence and national security come about? Um, so I wrote a report uh, that came out this July, uh, right after I joined CNAS, uh, that was published through the Harvard Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Uh, the title of the report, unsurprisingly, is Artificial Intelligence and National Security. Um, now, if you may recall uh, that back in October of 2016, uh, the Obama administration White House released three reports on artificial intelligence. Uh, one called Preparing for the Future of Artificial Intelligence, another one on the National Research and Development Strategic Plan, and then the third one on the impact of jobs in the economy. Uh, missing from that equation and those three reports was a detailed analysis of how artificial intelligence was going to impact the military, the intelligence community, and warfare. Uh, and so when talking to a bunch of government stakeholders, uh, they recognized that this was a gap in the existing analysis and literature. Uh, and so we talked about um, scoping a project that would sort of uh, write the report that the White House did not get around to writing uh, and that they were hoping to, to do in the future. Um, so the individual that I talked to was Jason Matheny, who is the director and uh, chief executive of the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity. So if you are familiar with DARPA, uh, which is the sort of futuristic research and development organization in the military. IARPA is the sister agency that serves the intelligence community. And so this was a policy analysis that was looking at where we are today in artificial intelligence, uh, what is the plausible realm of the future for how this technology might evolve, and then how will that evolution impact national security uh, from a military perspective, from an intelligence perspective, and also from an economic perspective, which ultimately feeds back into national power and military power. Um, so that was a very exciting analysis that has just come out from July. We are currently um, going around and briefing relative, uh, relevant stakeholders uh, in the defense community, in the diplomatic community, uh, and even in the law enforcement community, uh, law enforcement community because we really haven't found an area uh, where artificial intelligence isn't making a big impact. Uh, but we also want to engage with the public, and that's what today is about. We've got a lot of interest from folks in the government about your report. Yeah, um, it's great. I just got an invitation to um, go to Europe uh, to brief some stakeholders there, too. So 
this is a very hot button issue right now. Um, just about everybody is thinking through these, uh, these issues because the pace of technological progress is such um, that it really seemed like these were issues that would be dealt with in the far future. Uh, but it is very clear uh, that these are issues that we need to reconcile today. We're kind of at this point where it feels like the, you know, there's been such a buzz of, of AI in the past couple of years, and you've had people really begin to start thinking through the implications for uh, different kinds of industries, transportation, finance, we're seeing some of those applications come out. And the national security community is just waking up now to say, what's going on for, what does this mean for us, yeah. right? Um, and there's, there's less really, I mean, really other than your report, there's just not that much out yet. It was people really analyzing, okay, what are the implications for national security? Mm -hmm. What might people do with this? There's been a lot about robotics and unmanned or uninhabited systems in the military context, but that's just yeah. a, real, it's a really narrow application of AI, really. Yeah. Um, and so it seems like the, the community is kind of waking up to, okay, well, what might this mean? Yeah, I, I would say uh, there is a lot of eagerness uh, and a lot of excitement about how do we use AI to accomplish X? Um, and what there has not been as much of so far is the sort of deep strategic thinking of how will AI shape all these trends that we are interested in and what will the impacts be on national security. Um, so we're excited to talk about that report and uh, let's take a look at what the other questions are. Um, so we've got one that says, uh, what goals uh, should the US national security community set uh, in making policy regarding artificial intelligence? Um, we outline basically three goals uh, that we think that the United States in particular should set. Uh, one is to uh, use artificial intelligence technology to preserve uh, military technological superiority. Um, so if you're, uh, if you may, perhaps some of you have encountered uh, the third offset, uh, which was the Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work's strategy um, for how to you know, ensure technological supremacy. The United States basically uh, since the end of the Cold War has had a major technological advantage in any kind of armed conflict. We have stealth aircraft, other folks don't. We have precision guided munitions, which means we can bomb anywhere we want to within a range of a meter or two from hundreds of miles away, other folks don't. So those were the sort of supreme technological edge uh, that essentially guaranteed victory in sort of a conventional military context with the United States. However, uh, the United States, there are now other countries that are matching uh, these technological capabilities. And so we now have to ask ourselves, if other people have stealth, if other people have precision guided munitions, what is the next technology that can give the United States an enduring edge? Uh, the US military is very interested in artificial intelligence as a potential answer to that question. So that's the first goal, ensuring military supremacy. Uh, the second goal is that we want to um, allow for peaceful use of AI. Um, AI really has made the most progress uh, in the commercial sphere and the civilian sphere, and there's a lot of reason to be very excited uh, about what AI might bring to the healthcare space, um, to finance, and some of the other areas that you mentioned. Um, AI is going to be relevant to a lot of different areas, and as the military seeks to uh, achieve its objectives, we want to make sure that that doesn't step on um, any of the other good that AI can do. We want to ensure that AI can be used safely, um, but we want to do that in a way that does not harm uh, the wider economy which then feeds into the third goal uh, that we recommend that the United States set, uh, which is to mitigate the harmful effects of AI. Um, the most well-known harmful effects are the ones that uh, Elon Musk and others are uh, publicizing in the popular media um, in a theory that can likely be summarized as AI is gonna kill us all. Um, but even beyond the AI is gonna kill us all theory, uh, there are plenty of um, you know, complications and risks that we uh, ensure um, as we adopt wider AI, which basically comes through as you um, adopt any technology. Um, adopting the automobile uh, entailed a lot of risks. Adopting the aircraft entailed a lot of risks. Um, and so we wanna look through what are the near-term risks of artificial intelligence and what are the long-term risks of artificial intelligence, um, both huge risks and also maybe not so huge risks, um, and think through what is the policy um, that we can pursue that will mitigate the threat from those risks. And those are the three goals. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know, one of the interesting challenges here is there are a lot of these um, near-term, very real safety problems in, in AI technology. So there are sort of the, the fears that in the long run we're, we're summoning the demon, as Musk has put it, with AI, and it's going to eat us all or turn us all into paper clips or something, or something horrible. But in the near term, there are very real um, just safety concerns. There are um, control problems in AI systems. Uh, there are ways in which it may do something surprising and unexpected, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Um, there are vulnerabilities uh, to spoofing attacks and adversarial data that some types of systems have. 
And so when you think about this in a national security context, when you may have very high stakes applications, mm -hmm. right? You may be using um, AI systems to help screen, you know, people coming through airport security. You may be using them to find potential terrorists. You may be using them in weapon systems. Um, how do you think about these risks in an adversarial context, right? Where others may be trying, they're, they're going to be trying to find ways to fool your systems. Mm -hmm. We want to anticipate that. But also, how do you think intelligently about safety when there's this trade-off, right? Where you don't want to, um, you know, say, step back from not using the technology. I think, that, I think there's kind of a, a good analogy to what we see in stock trading, where you, know, you can't compete in the world of high-frequency trading with humans, right? You, humans can't respond in milliseconds or microseconds. So it's got to be automated. But we've seen accidents that come from that. Um, flash crashes or other situations where an algorithm goes awry and, and in one case bankrupted a company in about 45 minutes. So, you know, in the military context or the national security context, how should the government think about using this technology in a safe and prudent way? You know, and how do you think about this in a competitive environment? So now in stock trading, they've come up with these circuit breakers to halt trading. Things go out of control. Well, you don't have that in the in a war, right? There's no referee to call timeout. Yeah. Um, there are places where, and, and there was just this letter that came out this week by Musk and some other robotics calling for the UN to be involved in some capacity um, uh, on autonomous weapons is one particular, particular example. You know, there are historical examples of places where countries have been able to cooperate, but there are lots of places where the cooperation breaks down. It's not, it's not that easy um, as just, you know, writing a treaty, you're having the UN kind of weigh in and come up with some solution. So, I think it's going to be a tough, a tough challenge. Uh, I think Paul makes a great point, and I would like to particularly emphasize the adversarial uh, nature of AI and the national security dimension that comes in. Uh, if you think about an autonomous vehicle, a self-driving car, um, most of the designers, when they were thinking through, um, you know, what do we need to be successful in a self-driving car, they were thinking about problems such as the weather or a child chasing a ball into the middle of the street. Um, the types of situations they were not thinking through is, okay, our enemy is trying to camouflage itself. It might try to hack us to induce us to crash, or it might be firing missiles at us. Um, so the types of challenges that when you think about how do we mitigate risk, how do we ensure safety um, for autonomous vehicles in a military context are a lot more challenging um, than those of in a civilian context. And as we come up with increased, more and more increasingly capable systems, we want to ensure that we have safety and risk mitigation um, you know, front of mind through the entire process. Yeah. Uh, what other questions we got? Can we scroll down a little bit to see what, what new questions we have popping up? Uh, so here's, here's a good one for, for framing the, the larger discussion. Uh, the question reads, as someone who knows very little about AI, can you help me delineate between narrow and strong AI? How close is the world to developing strong AI, and what are the possible implications of strong AI? Uh, Paul, you want to take that one? Yeah, so so I hear um, these terms thrown around a lot, and sometimes in a, in a confusing way. Um, I'll try to give the best description that I heard from, a, from an AI scientist that really delineated between um, one dimension between narrow and general AI systems, and on almost a separate axis, strong and weak AI. And sometimes they're used interchangeably, but I think it's a little bit simpler if you think about them as separate dimensions. Um, today's systems, like say AlphaGo or a self-driving car um, or IBM's Watson, are narrow in the sense that they're able to solve specific problems, but they don't have a general purpose solving ability that say humans have, where we can learn to play chess or play checkers or drive a car, or pick up a range of different kinds of tasks. And we don't know how to build machines today that can do that. You could train a machine to do one thing and then build a different one to do something else and maybe bolt them together. Mm -hmm. But the machines can't learn a task and then learn something different without maybe forgetting right now the initial task. There's a problem of catastrophic forgetting. Um, they can't transfer learning from one task to the other. So AlphaGo um, is really good at playing Go, but it can't necessarily take those strategic concepts and apply them to chess or some other game. Um, so that's, a, that's a, an issue. Strong and weak AI is more of a philosophical thing about the nature of um, sentience, right? So I assume that Greg, like me, has some sort of internal um, subjective view of the world and is sentient and actually conscious. We kind of assume that on people. And this concept of strong and, and weak AI 
comes from a thought experiment um, about whether or not machines really do that, whether they're actually thinking, they're actually feeling subjectively, or they're merely simulating that. Um, and how could you ever tell really whether that's the case or not? Yeah. Um, so this is a very important dimension uh, as we're thinking through what is the likely future for artificial intelligence. Um, so far, our experience in research has been we have been making remarkable progress in narrow AI. Um, we have knocked down games like uh, chess in 1997. Now we've uh, knocked down Go, which is a game of much richer mathematical and strategic complexity. Um, and we keep knocking down these specific tasks. And then there is the question of, is this actually building towards um, strong AI? Is this actually building towards um, specific consciousness? I would say nobody is really predicting that deep learning um, as one particular type of machine learning, as one particular architecture that you can uh, you know, move forward in for artificial intelligence, nobody really thinks that deep learning is at risk of uh, producing consciousness. Um, but deep learning is probably not the last uh, innovation in machine learning and the last machine learning paradigm that we are going to develop. Um, so we are probably making uh, a lot of progress um, towards general AI, uh, but the current method by which we are doing that is making progress in narrow AI. Um, in order for us to have like really um, real impressive progress in general AI, we would probably need to move to a, to a different paradigm uh, than deep learning. But deep learning itself, um, it's pretty young. Uh, it really only became popular uh, in 2012, and that's what's led to so much progress in narrow AI recently. Um, one thing I'll also add is that um, narrow AI is incredibly useful um, from a military context. Uh, so one uh, example um, of how you might use narrow AI in a military context is for image recognition. Um, if you have ever seen uh, Google Earth, uh, those photos are taken either from an airplane uh, taking a picture of the city or the Earth, um, or a satellite uh, taking a picture. Um, and the US intelligence community takes a lot of satellite imagery. It uh, takes a lot of airborne reconnaissance. Uh, drone video feeds are also sort of an example for this. Um, and until uh, machine learning and deep learning really made a lot of the recent progress that we've seen, um, all, analyzing all of that imagery had to be done by an individual human. Um, the U.S. intelligence community employs hundreds or thousands of people uh, to perform this type of task. If suddenly um, you could automate it, uh, that would really expand um, what you're able to do with intelligence analysis um, and make our systems a lot more capable. And that's only with narrow AI. Um, what we're seeing right now is that narrow AI is being integrated into a lot more dimensions of uh, military and intelligence capabilities. Um, and the results are pretty astonishing. So I think that segues really nice into a question about um, how the Defense Department might restructure itself to integrate AI into, into military units. Um, and so I think that's a great, a great way to talk about some of these advantages. Um, the question is about, you know, would the military downsize or maybe retrain service members or create new jobs and career fields? Uh, no doubt we've seen this over time, right? That as new military technologies come along, whether it's uh, airplanes or submarines or tanks, we create new, um, new job fields, in some cases entirely new services. We actually just saw the elevation of cyber command to a higher level command now on its own, um, as that's become a big issue in just the, the past few years. So that's, I mean, whether we'll see an AI command, I think that's really unlikely. Um, the DoD tends to structure itself that way. I think it's more likely that we're gonna see AI integrated into a whole range of different jobs and tasks. And the way those jobs are performed will then change and evolve. Um, just like in other industries, you know, Doctors, we'll still have doctors 30 years from now, but what doctors do is changing, right? Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, if we have a doctor 30 years from now, you know, giving you the diagnosis, we're probably doing it wrong because we probably will let machines do it better. And doctors will instead be doing things like helping you think through um, what are the risks of various procedures and how you should weigh kind of pros and cons of different options, how to interpret the test results. So similarly, we'll have people in charge of accomplishing a mission, uh, seizing this hill, uh, storming the beach, but the way that it gets carried out is going to change. It may be involving robotic systems, it may be involving AI systems that process information differently, um, with humans making kind of higher level judgment calls. You know, exactly what that looks like, I think it's really in flux right now in the military. There are some places where the US military has been really um, innovative and really embracing this, particularly for support functions. Things like um, logistics convoys, diffusing bombs, doing surveillance and reconnaissance, tanking missions, so flying the aircraft that gives gas to another aircraft. Um, in combat roles, they've been much more hesitant. 
Um, really, there's just not a lot of enthusiasm for giving up the human in those combat roles for a variety of reasons, even in places where it might make sense to have, say, a robotic system forward on the battlefield. People tend to be sort of saying, well, that's, that's a job I want to do still. Um, all right, what else, uh, what else do you want, what do you want to tackle next? Um, okay, so let's, let's uh, take a look at the question. With the implementation of narrow AI, how would this fundamentally change the character of war? How would this change the process of policy making for politicians? How would this change doctrine and how nations go to war? Do you think that the fact warfare could become cheaper and not risk taking the loss of human life would raise the frequency propensity for war? Um, this is interesting. So uh, let me let me start with the last question of uh, could warfare become cheaper and not risking the life of uh, human, sorry, not risking the loss of human life, increase the frequency of propensity for war? Um, I think we have already seen uh, some elements of, of how this would play out in the cyber sphere. Um, in the in the cyber domain, I think we are seeing a lot more willingness uh, of states to uh, infiltrate each other's systems, to manipulate each other's systems, um, and essentially to take risks that they would not take in the physical domain. Um, so for, for the, the simplest uh, reason, right, uh, Russia does not usually violate U.S. airspace. Um, they know that doing so would risk um, military conflict. Um, in cyberspace, Russia is everywhere, constantly. Um, and the explanation for that is that their mission is officially classified under espionage, uh, which is not usually viewed as um, justifying a retaliation or justifying going to war. Um, but the distinction is not actually as clear as you might think. Um, if somebody infiltrates your nuclear missile system, uh, whether that's for an espionage purpose or for an attack purpose, um, the results look a lot similar, right? They're in your system, and if they wanted to switch from espionage to attack, um, that could change uh, quite quickly. So I think already in the digital domain, we've seen um, that people are willing to push the envelope um, in a way that they had not been previously in the physical domain. And whether or not AI um, increases that, I think it is, it's entirely possible. One could imagine um, that the norm for violating airspace uh, for uh, drone surveillance, for micro drone surveillance, um, looks more like cyber espionage uh, than the norm for policing aerospace that we currently have. Um, I think if you are the United States military, you like the norm that we have right now and you would like to maintain that. But I think our expectation should be that uh, countries who see it in their best interest will try to push these boundaries. So I think, I mean, I think around the edges, we've certainly seen elements of this already. So we've seen some of the things that you're talking about with drones start to happen early phases of that. We've seen a number of countries um, be willing to put drones into others' airspace in ways that they wouldn't. Um, it doesn't seem like they would if they had people in them. They wouldn't yeah. take more risk with them. And in particular, we've seen countries be willing to shoot them down in ways that um, I, I don't think they would, for the most part, if there was a human on board. Um, we did a major project over the last two years on drone proliferation here at CNAS. And as part of that, not only did we map what people were doing, but we did a survey experiment where we asked um, people who had experience with drones in the U.S. national security community, the U.S. general public, and then the um, general public from India to kind of get an international perspective or get a foreign perspective. and. And we found we had kind of different scenarios where you could put an aircraft into harm's way and one group got, there's a person on it, another group got it was on man, see if they responded differently. And then similarly, your enemy's done this to you, do you shoot it down? And we found in all these groups, people were more willing to put an aircraft in harm's way if it didn't have a person on board. They were more willing to shoot it down. And what was really interesting though is they saw it as less escalatory being shot down. So it didn't necessarily lead to more conflict. And that's what we've seen when we've actually seen countries shoot down various drones. Turkey shot down a uh, Russian drone that threw into their airspace last year. Syria shot down a U.S. drone. The U.S. has shot down Syrian drones or uh, drones on behalf of the pro-regime kind of Syrian groups, like Hezbollah or some other groups operating in the area. So you know, it's not clear how far that kind of where that goes. Then yeah. I think I am a skeptic personally of the idea that robotics will lead to somehow bloodless wars on the battlefield, right? It seems to me that the history of warfare has always been innovations that give greater standoff from, you know, first time someone picked a rocket and threw it up at somebody, and, and people always find a way to hurt other people with them, because that's how wars end, right, is when someone inflicts pain. So will it be enough when people say, well, you killed my robot, I surrender? I, I suspect probably not, actually. Um, and then wars will still be violent. You know, I think this question, one of these questions is about the character of war. 
there's this kind of um, subtle phrasing in the, the military field about the character of warfare and the nature of war. That seems like the same maybe to a layperson, but it's a very important distinction to those who study military history. The way this basically goes to people say that the character of war, the way that people fight wars, the tools they use, the tactics are constantly evolving. They're always changing. But the nature of war itself is immutable. It doesn't change over time. So the sort of essential elements of chaos and uncertainty and violence, those are, those are immutable. I've had a number of people ask the question, would AI and automation change that? And I think it's a great, a great question. Could we envision a situation where we have now artificial actors on the battlefield that are not human, and there's something about the way that they operate, either the speeds they operate, or the scale, or the nature of their intelligence, that makes war something fundamentally different. And I think, I think possibly, yes, we could envision that. I don't know if we're seeing that now, but that's something to, to think about. Yeah, um, I'll just make one uh, prediction. I think targeted assassination uh, as an area um, that might be susceptible to a radical change um, from AI, both because it might be easier to assassinate somebody in a way that is difficult to attribute, um, and it's also more easier to assassinate someone um, and uh, take less risks when you do so, both being caught, but also who cares if your uh, robot is de destroyed. Um, one technological development recently that I uh, have been interested in um, is the use of automated guns. Uh, so there's a commercial uh, gun you can buy right now um, that essentially any lay person who is untrained on how to use a firearm uh, can pretty reliably hit targets from quite far away. Um, and that's because it's augmented uh, with you know, computer technology. And then there's also uh, been looking at uh, adding sniper rifles to drones. Um, these types of technologies, I think, will um, lead to very surprising uh, combat outcomes that are very unfamiliar. Um, and we are making progress quite rapidly. Uh, there's also the, the possibility of um, small robot platforms, uh, I think something like the size of a mouse, right, that could be used to inject poison or anything like this. Um, the point is the future is, is a long time away uh, and we are making very rapid progress and some stuff that sounds uh, very sci-fi right, right now um, might not be so sci-fi at the pace we're making progress. I think if you told people how we fight a war today from 1970, they would also think it sounds like science fiction. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely um, one of the things that we've seen that has evolved war for, changed warfare significantly in the past thirty years or so is the advent of precision guided weapons. And the U.S. really, um, I mean, Greg touched on this earlier. The U.S. really kind of demonstrated its effectiveness first in the Gulf War, and now others have started to kind of catch up and follow suit. We have yet to see that technology really filter down to the level of the infantry soldier on the ground. Mm -hmm. So if you were to grab an infantry soldier from the beaches of Normandy and put them in a squad that was fighting in Iraq or Afghanistan. The basic infantry tactics are not that different. Um, the weapons are a little bit different. We've got night vision, we've got body armor now, but the maneuvering, the fighting is very, very similar. Um, we're likely to see, I think, that change. A combination of things like the smart rifles that Greg mentioned that do all of the aiming for you and even correct for range and wind and other factors. Um, precision guided bullets that can maneuver on their own. They're, they're pretty costly, but they exist. Small drones. Um, small um, um, munitions like that, that um, the, um, oh, the name is escaping me, but it's basically like a guided, a guided missile that you can launch from your backpack that flies around as a small drone and then attacks people. All of these kind of precision guided weapons that now come down in the hands of the infantry soldier, I think are likely to train, you know, change infantry level combat dramatically in ways that are frankly just likely to make it much more lethal and much more dangerous in the coming decades. Great. Uh, there's a question that reportedly China is leading the charge in AI race. Uh, is it foreseeable the US DOD will suffer or be at a disadvantage by not developing slash integrating emerging AI systems? When would our current systems, weapons, processes become obsolete? And what would this look like? Um, I'm happy to take that. I think China is currently um, very fixated on making progress in AI for the same reason that we are. Uh, if you look at the, the National China AI Strategic Plan that came out in July, um, they see artificial intelligence as synonymous with the future of national power uh, and military power. Um, now, this, this question makes it sound like China is currently ahead. That is not the case. Um, China, uh, Chinese military technology in AI is not as advanced as the United States, and Chinese commercial technology uh, in AI is not as advanced 
Um, however, going forward, uh, China has some very interesting advantages. Uh, for one thing, even though the U.S. and U.K. Uh, commercial industry um, is ahead of the Chinese AI, AI industry, um, Chinese tech companies have proven an ability uh, to innovate. Uh, if you look at WeChat, their social media platform, um, uh, Facebook and Snapchat openly admit to copying a lot of uh, WeChat features. And then in the drone space, um, a Chinese company, DJI, uh, is the world leader in the commercial and industrial drone market um, and has come up with some very impressive innovations. Um, so I think Chinese tech companies have proven their ability to innovate and they also have a closer relationship um, with the Chinese government. So whereas when Google acquired Boston Dynamics, a um, robotics firm that did a lot of work for DARPA and the military, um, they canceled all of DARPA's military contracts. Um, when Google acquired DeepMind, which is a UK firm and arguably the world leader in artificial intelligence uh, research and development, um, DeepMind required Google as terms of the acquisition contract, uh, thou shalt not use this research uh, for military purposes or surveillance purposes. Um, so what we are seeing is that uh, US companies and UK companies have the best AI tech in the world, um, but they're also much more hesitant about working with their government uh, than Chinese tech firms might. So for instance, um, when China just recently established uh, its National Deep Learning Laboratory as a partnership uh, between a couple of Chinese universities, Baidu uh, and a government agency, um, those universities that are partnering with Baidu, uh, a Chinese tech giant, are also the universities who are developing autonomous weapons uh, for the military. Um, so that close relationship between the Chinese commercial industry um, and the Chinese military uh, is something that really might give them an edge going forward. And uh, the Department of Defense is trying to trying to convince Silicon Valley um, to help it out in this in this you know future of technological uh, warfare. Um, but for right now, I'd say they're pretty skeptical in Silicon Valley. And I think there's also a question about what is the right, what is the most significant metric for military advantage? And I think the history of innovations in warfare suggests that it's not actually um, being there first, being a first mover in the technology, or having the best technology. In some cases, that helps if you can really hold on to an advantage. So the US advantage in stealth is a good example of that, right? The US has been able to kind of bottle that for a period of time. Precision guided weapons has proliferated over time, but, but at a relatively slow pace. The US has still had a good advantage there. But in a lot, of, a lot of places, the technology proliferates pretty rapidly, particularly when it comes to the commercial sector, right? So AI is not being developed in secret military labs, right? It's coming out of commercial companies. It's already very diffuse. There are a number of Chinese companies that are leading AI companies, right? They may not be the, the top, but they're, they're close to it. They're perfectly respectable. Right, yeah. yeah. They're doing great work. Right, so, so in that world, what seems to matter historically when you look at things like um, airplanes or machine guns or other technologies is who finds the best ways of using this technology? How do you implement it? Both how do you engineer the systems, but also what is the military doctrine that underpins what you do with it? Um, in the interwar period between World War I and World War II, there was a lot of experimentation thinking about well, what do you do with tanks? What do you do with airplanes? People knew that they would be relevant. We'd seen them at the end of World War I, but how do you use them in different philosophies and strategies among different countries? And so that's a contest. It's not just about um, having access to the technology, but also access to the ideas and having military innovations that are willing to kind of be creative and push the boundaries. And I think there's, there's just pros and cons there on the US side. I mean, the US has, I think, a lot of creative and individual, uh, creative thinkers, people that are good at coming up with new ideas. I don't know that the bureaucracy always incentivizes that kind of behavior. Yeah, I, I got to say, I'm pretty worried about the U.S. military bureaucracy's ability to effectively adopt AI. Um, to bring in, uh, you know, a, a concept that is very popular uh, in the, the tech world, disruptive innovation. Um, this essentially says that uh, companies are usually pretty good um, at adopting new innovations that their highest paying customers like and are willing to pay more money for. Um, and they're usually pretty bad at adopting innovations that are cheap, uh, lower profit, uh, and can't do stuff that their highest paying customers are interested in. Um, so they're and they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty uh, scared, right, of innovations that make their current excellence uh, obsolete. Um, so the canonical example of this is that Kodak did not want to adopt the digital camera um, because they were already making a ton of money selling film. 
uh, and the digital cameras were not as good as the best film cameras. And so even though they invented digital cameras, they basically neglected them until it was far too late. Um, I, see there, I see a really potential um, synergy there uh, with the US military. If you think about um, stealth technology, that's the type of technology that the US military loves. It's incredibly expensive, it's incredibly uh, complicated, so nobody else can do it, and it makes what we are best at even better, uh, building amazing fighter aircraft. Contrast that with artificial intelligence, uh, which might be cheap and easy uh, and you know, widely available from commercial technology, and it also might make a lot of the stuff that the US military loves best about itself obsolete. Um, that is, a, from a bureaucratic politics perspective, that is a worst of all possible worlds scenario for technological adoption. And in, in, some, in some sense, you could even say that that's an advantage for China, right? Um, China currently is, is working on an aircraft carrier, but they don't have, uh, you know, 10 aircraft carrier battle groups that they've sunk hundreds of billions of dollars into. Um, so if it turns out, for instance, this is just a hypothesis, if it turns out that some advantage in AI and robotics makes the aircraft carrier battle group completely obsolete, um, what you would see in the US military is all these generals in charge of aircraft battle groups or admirals in charge of uh, aircraft carrier battle groups saying that that technology is bad and it's actually not that relevant and they would try and defend the relevance of the aircraft carrier battle group. Um, and meanwhile, China would say, oh, great, we have a, a means of, of getting rid of a key uh, US advantage very quickly. Um, we would love to adopt that as quickly as possible. So I think Paul's point about the bureaucratic politics here is, is really significant. And we've seen pockets of this in, in how the military has treated robotics. In some places, um, when they're doing jobs nobody wants to do, people have been happy to use the robot to go do that. But there have been places where you've seen a lot of resistance. I think one of the most egregious examples that I've seen is um, the Army medical community has written not one, not two, but three official policy memorandums saying that they don't support um, evacuating wounded soldiers, doing casualty evacuation on the battlefield with unmanned systems, mm -hmm. whether it's a ground vehicle or a helicopter. Um, now, they have reasons for that. I think that they're wrong, and I think that that should be an option, at least in our toolkit. But, but they, they don't, I mean, they're not trying to, to abandon soldiers. That's not their rationale. But part of it is that they have a community who that's their job, right, in the Army, is to go out there and rescue wounded soldiers. And so they'll say, well, no, I don't want a robot to do that job. I should do my job. Now, contrast that with the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps does not have a dedicated community to medical evacuation. So there's no constituency bureaucratically to resist this technology. And the Marine Corps has actually publicly said that they, they think it's a great idea. Why would we not want to evacuate wounded Marines if that's the best way to get them out on, say, some unmanned cargo helicopter, which the Marine Corps and the Army are both building? So there are going to be, I think, these hurdles to, to work through. Yeah, I think um, if you're a fan of DARPA or the military tech community, uh, you might think that the military is where the future happens first uh, and has the best technology in the world. I think. Um, what we're seeing in the AI community is that actually a lot of the best technologies in the commercial community um, and a lot of the barriers to adoption are political or bureaucratic in nature. Um, and so that's the challenge as we try and uh, go after those three goals that we mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, There's a question about vulnerabilities. Let's yeah. tackle this one. I like this one. So the question is, um, what vulnerabilities would implementing AI across multiple DoD systems create and how could we protect against it? Do you want to take it? Uh, sure, I think, so I think there's a range of things to think about. Um, let's, let's tackle a couple of them. I think one, one easy um, challenge that I would say is that because existing systems are narrow, um, people often describe them as being brittle in the sense that they're, they're very good at solving a very particular problem. Um, but if you change the problem slightly or the environment changes or the context changes, the systems that we have don't necessarily have the ability to understand that things have changed or to adapt. Um, one of my favorite examples comes from a, um, a, the Jeopardy game when IBM's Watson went on, on Jeopardy. And there was a, a situation where Ken Jennings rang in, he got a question wrong, and Watson rings in and gives the exact same answer. Um, I'm terrible at Jeopardy, I, I'm not very good at these things, but I knew that was the wrong one after Jennings had said the wrong question, right? But Watson has the ability to actually hear what he was saying. So that was not part of his context. Now Watson did very good overall. He actually crossed Ken Jennings and Brad Buttery one pretty well. But but this is a, a consistent problem across these systems. So how do you compensate for this weakness? Um, 
what DOD has talked about is human machine teaming, which I think is the right paradigm of having um, humans involved in some capacity in problem solving um, as a way to kind of offset that. But it's just, it's not, it's easier said than done. How do you find the right balance between human and machine? How do you kind of use the, the strengths of both? Um, and particularly, how do you do that when AI is getting better over time? So the line is always shifting over time, right? So maybe today, this is the right balance between human and machine, but in five years or 10 years, that may not be the case. And I think that's, that's gonna be a, a problem yes, to work through going forward. Yeah, I think one of the um, interesting vulnerabilities that AI brings about is specific to machine learning um, as a paradigm of bringing about AI uh, compared to sort of the traditional software programming. Um, so if you think about a homing missile, um, like a heat-seeking missile, um, every line of code uh, in the software that is powering that heat-seeking missile was ultimately typed by a human being. Right, who knows um, why, they, uh, why they chose to do what they did. And if the homing missile uh, today goes wrong, um, we can audit that software and we can basically with 100% certainty say, okay, the reason why it failed was because of X. Um, with machine learning and especially deep learning, um, that is not always the case. Um, the, the, the software is not necessarily programmed by hand. What we do program by hand is an algorithm. And then the, the, the machine programs itself, essentially, based on exposure to a data set, exposure uh, to a series of examples. Um, and then once that, uh, once that machine fails, uh, you can't actually always ask the system, why did you make the decision that you made? Um, all they can say is, well, the statistics said that I would be better off if I made this decision. This is true in bad outcomes, and this is true in good outcomes. Um, when AlphaGo uh, defeated you know, the, the world champion of Go, we can look at a specific move, but the, the system cannot tell us um, the reason why I chose this move was because of you know, X, Y, or Z variable. Um, all it can say is it increased my chance of winning if, if I took that step. Um, so this is what we call the explainability problem. Um, and it's right now, uh, unique to deep learning systems and machine learning systems. And so we are currently working on, and the Defense Department is very interested in, uh, coming up with systems that actually are explainable. So instead of saying, oh, that image is of a cat, and you ask why, and you say, because it looks like all those other images you, you told me were a cat, uh, instead of we'll say something like features, like, well, it has pointy ears, it has whiskers, it has fur, you know, it has you know, this ratio of body type. So we're trying to build that explainability into the AI systems, but right now um, they don't really have them. And that is kind of vulnerability because it leads to the systems failing in ways that we can't necessarily understand or prevent, um, et cetera. So if you're imagining giving an AI uh, the use of lethal force, um, you want to know how it's going to wield that force, and you want it to be able to justify every aspect of the decision that it made. And the process of learning itself can introduce opportunities uh, for vulnerabilities for others to attack or vectors to attack. Right. right. So, so if you have a data set that you're using, either a training data set or you know it's, it's doing continuous learning in, in the real world, those are ways that an adversary might try to poison your data set or um, feed bad information to your algorithm to make it learn something in the wrong way and then maybe exploit that vulnerability, which is another thing to be concerned about. Yeah, I think um, when we first uh, started introducing uh, computers into the military and intelligence world, um, people did raise the issue of, well, these do create a new type of security threat. Um, but it took decades for us to fully understand the dimension of what we now you know, casually call cybersecurity. Um, the AI systems have a whole set of uh, you know security and um, cybersecurity type issues, and they don't always look like um, the security vulnerabilities that we are used to dealing with in traditional uh, computer software. And so, understanding those to a really rigorous extent uh, is very important if we want to use these systems safely and effectively. Yeah, they're a little bit like um, you can think about cybersecurity problems as problems in the software, bugs in the software. Um, and what we're talking about in some ways is things like cognitive security. Right, that the process of learning could allow the thing to learn the wrong thing, or learn, or have some some vulnerability. Maybe it's learned the right thing, but it still has some ability to be exploited or manipulated in some way. Some cognitive trick you can pull to to defeat the system. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got a question on. Uh, recently, Elon Musk made some noise by signing an open letter on the subject of combating killer robots with increasingly advanced artificial intelligence. Some claim it's pure marketing, while others are giving it a try. Uh, what's your take on this? Uh, 
So I think I should do a little bit of bragging on Paul's behalf here. Um, he was involved uh, while he was at the DOD in the team that was establishing a policy on autonomous weapons, um, which is not the same thing as a killer robot, but it's what most people think of when they think of a, a killer robot. I think I doesn't like that term. But yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> people thought uh, of the same thing. Yeah, and uh, so you really could not have a better expert in the world to answer this question. Now I'm going to turn it over to him. Sure. So, I mean, I think what's interesting about this letter is, is um, they're very vague on what solution they're looking for. So it was a letter signed by over 100 um, robotics and AI company CEOs and founders, um, really asking the UN to kind of do something. But they don't actually say what they want. It's notable um, that they actually don't call for a ban. I think that's really significant because there was a, another open letter two years ago signed by um, a similar group of people, some AI scientists, um, some, some of the same signatories, that explicitly did call for a ban. This one doesn't. Um, it's been characterized that way in the media in a couple outlets. Um, I think Wired got it right. Um, but, but, you know, what is, the, what is the solution here, right? So rogue kind of killer robots running amok, I don't think anybody thinks it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, but how do you, first of all, what, I mean, what is the technology we're talking about? That's a big challenge, actually. The UN's been having conversations for the past several years about this. And, you know, it's been framed as autonomous weapons. And it's been framed in the UN discussions as, well, these are future weapons that don't exist yet. But once you start down that path, even with those bounds, people are all over the place. So in conversations, it's very clear that some people are envisioning something that looks like a Roomba with, like, a gun on it. And other people are envisioning a Cylon from Battlestar Galactica. Well, I mean, different problems. Both problematic, okay, in their <laughs> own way, but very different kinds of problems. Yeah. And so, so that's a big challenge. Um, one another quote, related question is, okay, you know, what can be done on this? What timeline needs to be done? Um, I think that talks are good. Uh, they've been delayed this year because of funding problems at the UN, but there'll be some talks in November, uh, hopefully. I think that's good that countries are getting together to discuss the problem. But we don't really actually have a good understanding of what it is that we're worried about yet, in part because we can't point to someone building something, right? So there's sort of a vague nebulous concern that um, when you take, say, a predator drone and you add more autonomy, how much autonomy do you want it to have? It's a valid question. But you can't yet point to say, you know, this country is building this thing that is dangerous, and that makes it really challenging. Um, so I think it's going to be a while before we actually see a lot of concrete progress in this conversation. Yeah, I, I would add to that, um, the historical context is instructive here, right? Uh, as computers have gotten better, uh, militaries around the world have asked computers to do more and more. Um, so previously, uh, you know, aiming a rifle at a target was something that was a human's job. Uh, with, uh, you know, these new smart rifles um, and these entirely autonomous rifles, you can imagine more and more of that decision uh, shifting over to the robot. You know, the homing missile, um, a lot of the homing missiles, heat-seeking missiles in the common parlance, um, are marketed as fire and forget. Uh, so you shoot it and then you don't have to think about it anymore uh, because the com onboard computer is going to handle the rest of the problem. Um, I think that really, to me, seems like a killer robot, right? I mean, it's a robot that is, uh, you know, deciding uh, when, where, how, why, or, well, not even why. Um, the, the actual kill decision is going to be made. And so um, this is a seven decade trend. Uh, you know, very primitive computers were used uh, in World War II um, and more and more decision over the use of violence was being transferred over to them. So I think for me, uh, the, the, you know, the, this, the continuation of this trend uh, seems inevitable. So the question then shifts to, you know, how are we going to do it in a way that is consistent with our ethics, that is consistent with our values, um, and that is undergirded by a technological and policy regime um, that we are comfortable with? Um, and that's a very hard question, uh, and it's one of the reasons why the uh, AI and Global Security Initiative at CNAS was stood up. Yeah, I think one of the, uh, the challenges in this conversation is sometimes it's framed as, well, um, machines can't do X, Y, Z today. Well, maybe they can't today, but they're, they're really incredible advances. So what if that shifts in five or 10 years? Um, what then? And you can get people have very different assumptions about what's possible. Um, I've been in conversations in these international discussions where I've heard people who, um, who frankly, some of them claim to be AI scientists saying, well, you know, machines can't recognize objects. That's, I mean, that's just bogus. That's totally yeah. garbage. They're, they're really good at object recognition. They have some vulnerabilities, but they're pretty good at that. Um, and there's a lot of reason to believe that a machine could say recognize 
you know, an AK-47 better than a human? I think a better question is not what the machines can and can't do today, but if we had all the technology in the world, what would we still want humans to do in warfare and why? Um, I'll, I'll, you know, give an example for, say, driving. Okay, if the machine is better at driving a car, let it drive the car, right? A, we don't need humans to do that things. But presumably, I'm still deciding where I go. It would be kind of weird to get in a car and then let the car decide where I should go for the day. Oh, actually, um, Sandia National Laboratories is basically coming up with like Google Maps slash Waze uh, for military context. So route planning and maybe even final destination. Well, route planning would be great, right? Yeah. But like, I mean, maybe, maybe final destination. But I mean, yeah. I don't know. I'd like to be in control of my daily schedule, right? It, that's that's sort of like a, a, a convenience thing. In the military, you have these are value judgments. So, you know, how many civilian casualties, collateral damage, is acceptable for some military target? The laws of war say that collateral damage happens; it's acceptable, um, but it gives no no clear quantitative boundaries. It says that collateral damage has to be proportional to the military necessity of a target. That's a judgment call. And so I think that's an area where um, we're likely to want humans in control for probably a long period of time. Yeah. What other questions should we should we tackle here? Do you want to scroll down a little bit? Yeah, sure. I think you can keep coming down. Okay. What jumps out at you? Um, oh, there's one about uh, how does quantum computing tie into the development of AI? Um, so for those who are not familiar with uh, quantum computing, uh, this is a novel architecture um, of computing that is not sort of the traditional silicon-based transistors um, that we are familiar with and not even necessarily the zeros and ones um, that we're used to thinking of uh, as you know, fundamental to computing. Um, it's a new architecture that relies upon the quantum states of matter um, that allows you to do sort of information processing with not just a zero and a one, but sort of a fuzzy quantum in between uh, a zero and a one. Um, the result is you get a computer that is not good at answering every type of computational question, um, but is significantly better, or at least has the potential to be significantly better um, at answering certain types of questions. Um, the relevance for artificial intelligence here is that um, it has not been proven, I would say beyond a shadow of a doubt, but there's strong reason to suspect uh, that some flavors of artificial intelligence computation um, are really uh, well aligned uh, to the performance characteristics of quantum computers. Um, so what that looks like uh, in, in a military context, I think is a little bit up in the air. Um, you know, quantum computers require to be cooled to liquid helium temperatures, uh, which is like four degrees Kelvin above absolute zero, like negative hundreds of degrees. Um, so it's pretty unlikely that you're going to see a quantum computer inside a tank uh, anytime soon. Um, but I think uh, there's a lot more discussion about maybe you could have a quantum computer that then could be accessed through the cloud. Um, and you could offload certain types of computations. Um, I would say the, the specific uh, you know, outcome of how it's going to impact artificial intelligence is still up in the air, uh, but there's reason to think uh, that quantum computers are going to be very important to the future of AI. So we've got a question about regulations. Um, the question is, while the topic of today's discussions, I think some of what we see in the media is about increasing regulations, what can be expected from and done about agents that act outside of regulation? So for example, terrorists that take advantage of um, available tools and use them for malicious ends. Um, I think the answer is, yeah, that's a huge problem. A huge a problem. <laughs> whole range of technologies, right? It's a problem with malware. Um, it's a problem with drones today that we're seeing. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's a problem with regular cars. With ever, yeah, right. I mean, that is, like the, that is the terrorist attack vector of the moment is yeah. regular cars. Um, and so I think, like, you can think of a range of different solutions that people try to implement. Right? So one is trying to restrict access to the technology. Um, and that just depends a lot upon how, how everyday accessible it is. Um, now, if you try to go buy you know, um, a Stinger missile here in the United States, like, yeah, you can't go buy that, right? Yeah. So there are some places where you can restrict access. Um, that's harder internationally, right? If you go overseas, yeah, there are, um, if the US military, they have to worry about non-state groups that have access to um, anti-tank guided missiles and, and, and anti-air rockets and missiles. Um, 
And then I think, you know, um, it's really hard, though, with things that are very widely available, like, say, cheap commercial drones. You know, what can you do to stop someone from buying uh, a DJI drone and then slapping some explosives on it? And I think the answer is we're seeing really not much. Really not um, much, yeah. The nature of the world we live in is yeah. countering it. There's, um, there's some discussion, and I think some work on be being done about um, programming the drone itself to not engage in certain behaviors. So. Um, if you could imagine an autonomous car, uh, you know, you say, hey, drive uh, yourself into this crowd while I'm, you know, very far away. Um, the idea would be that the car would recognize uh, that it's, you know, being asked to commit murder and refuse to do it. And by the same token, um, you know, uh, DJI, which is, a, you know, one of the, the leading commercial drone manufacturers, um, has put what is called geofencing. And so it's, uh, it's putting its drones that will refuse to fly over an airport, uh, for instance. So there might be, um, the, as Paul said, the first thing that you can do is try and stop them from getting the technology. Um, and that's quite hard uh, because we do expect it to be widely commercially available. Uh, the second thing that you can do is you can put regulations on the creation of the technology um, that try to make it safer. Uh, which would be like geofencing, where the, the system refuses to, uh, you know, be a victim to violence. Um, and if that fails, if they manage to hack the drone um, or, you know, uh, uh, dissolve the safeguards, um, then your third thing is you're coming up with countermeasures. Um, so in the instance of uh, drone attacks or, you know, any kind of autonomous vehicle attacks, um, the military is acutely interested um, in what can be done uh, to repel drone attacks. So there's talks about lasers that can shoot drones out of the sky. There's talk about um, other types of EM broadcasts that can, can make drones ineffective. But basically, you really only have some flavor of those three options. Uh, and when it comes to AI, um, those options are pretty complicated, and they look uh, applicable to a very diverse set of activities. And in the military space, in the national security space, um, it's people's job to assume that the attempts to regulate it and prevent the technology fail, and you're going to have to uh, counter these things. Yeah. Um, and they're going to proliferate over time, and people are going to find ways to hack them. And so there are going to be malicious uses of, of AI, just like there are malicious uses of software and automobiles and other things. Absolutely. So that's, um, that's something people are going to have to, have to work on. Great. Um, I think we're, we're Is that our hour? out of time. Yeah. OK. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to continue to be online uh, answering questions, I think, with keyboards uh, for a while yet longer. So if you're still interested and we didn't get to your question, uh, feel free to ask it. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks very much for joining us. Yep. Thanks.